Good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. It's good to worship with you all this morning and, and also to hear about the awesome things that are happening at Sparrow Gardens. I felt yeah, very encouraged and I'm not someone that has either a green or, I don't know what the opposite of a green thumb is, a black thumb, but um, I'm somewhere in the middle, so I was very interested and I'd love to hear more about <laughs> what's going on, what's wrong with my plant at home right now. <laughs> okay, well, before we begin, let's, let's pray together and invite God to speak to us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word is truth and your word brings light and life. We invite you, God, to speak your truth to us this morning, that your, your name alone would be magnified and praised. We pray in thanks, in Jesus' name, amen. A couple of years ago, the world was shut down because of the pandemic, and so much of our lives, our day-to-day -day lives, they changed. We were instructed to stay home, um, it was so jarring and it was so surreal those first few weeks when our sanctuary was empty and, and at the time, Pastor Ken and I would, would still come up uh, and, and, and stand behind this pulpit to lead the call to worship or to preach. And it was so surreal to just see an empty sanctuary and we tried our best to keep those important things going on and on. And one of these important things that needed, that, that the world felt like they have to continue going on was professional sports. Professional sports was something that needed to continue at that time when the world shut down. The people, people needed to be entertained or distracted. And so, you know, you had some leagues like the NBA or the, the NHL, they, they went into these, these secure COVID bubbles to play um, games, so, you know, fans wouldn't be allowed in, but they, they went into these bubbles where teams would gather and they would play. But one of the biggest differences was that, fan, that, that players wouldn't be playing in front of fans. And so I'm not sure which league was the first to adopt this, but they came up with this solution. If I can have that image behind me. So they came up with cardboard fans for some leagues and in this, this Taiwanese baseball league, mannequins as well, and it's bizarre. <laughs> they had these cardboard cutout fans, or they had these fans shown on screen, and, and if you've ever been to a live event, it's not just about people sitting in the seats that makes, that, that fills the presence of, certainly it adds to it, but it's also when the fans cheer for their favorite players, or they boo, or, or there's an audible gasp when something happens, or there's, there's some sort of noise. And so, to compensate for this, these leagues, they started piping in fans' sounds of, of defense or a little bit of fake crowd noise, like, you know, it's kind of like muttering in the back. And so this is what happened in pro sports for, I don't know, for a year or, or maybe two. All this fake crowd noise and fake, fake people that filled the stands. It was bizarre. And... I think what's so bizarre about it is, is that it was so harrowing with how hollow and how empty and how, how fake it was. I remember showing this picture to, to Jill last night and she was like, oh, this, this one with the Taiwanese baseball fans, it's weird. You know, someone who's whose likeness or whose image could be represented on cardboard. You know, some of these leagues said, you know, you could submit your face, you could submit, you know, uh, upload this for a small fee. We could have you as a cardboard cutout at the game. And, and, you know, these cutouts, you know, while they were there to, to make the most of a hard time during those harder COVID years, but at the end of the day, it was inauthentic. It was fake. It was just to fill the seats to pump in some, some noise so that the players felt like they were playing for something. If you want to turn with me to our passage in today, it's a scripture, we're in Revelation chapter 3. Today's word in our passage, as, as Mindy read for us today, Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, 
is a very stern wake-up call to the church of Sardis, who, who, are similarly, who are similarly inauthentic. Sardis comes under some of the most severe scrutiny of these seven churches. They were apparently untroubled by heresy, and, and they were free from opposition at the time, so much so that they, they completely came to terms with their pagan environment. And although it retained, although the church retained this appearance of life, it was inauthentic. It was spiritually dead. They were just filling the seats. So for us to know, the city of Sardis at this time was a wealthy city, like many of the cities we've learned about so far. And one of the distinct attributes was that they were a very well-defended city in Asia Minor. And this, one of the things they attributed was their success was to the, the worship of the goddess of Artemis, the fertility goddess. These, these were people that were fascinated with death and immortality believing she had the ability to raise the dead back to life. And what made them also infamous was that as they poured out their love for this goddess, this, this Artemis, this building, this temple that they worshipped in for over 800 years was never completed. They built it they built these huge columns where this roof would have been. And, and for 800 years, that's, that's no short time, 800 years, they never completed the task. They left it incomplete. They would make their way to the temple. They would worship. They would perform all sorts of things, and they never finished it. And so Jesus addresses these very specific elements of who Sardis is, of who the city and church of Sardis is in his address to them. He begins in verse 1. He says this, uh, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Eugene Peterson's message translates verse 2 in this way, but I wouldn't know it by looking at your busy work. Nothing of God's work has been completed. Just as the city had been infamous for its incomplete temple that was fully functional, the church of Sardis was guilty of the same issue. They had started the Christian faith. They had grown and, and, and had learned how to walk the Christian walk and talk the Christian walk. They had learned how to, the semblance of what it liked, what lo looked like to be a Christ follower and and something changed. Eventually, they had the appearance of being vibrant and healthy, but on the inside, their works were incomplete. They had the appearance, they had this good reputation. Perhaps in their day, some might have said, man, that church in Sardis, they have it together. They have it together. But inside, they were going through the motions, they were participating, they were filling the seats, they were showing up to activities, but their life remains spiritually lifeless. And now, there isn't much specifics into what kind of compromise or, or what exactly they were struggling with or, or what led them to this lifelessness. There, there aren't these specifics in our letter today. But what we can tell as a contrast to the other churches, it seems there was no more persecution or op opposition to what they believed in. Those other churches that we've looked at so far in, in Revelation, they were honed and they were sharpened by that persecution. Seems that this church was contented to compromise. And so they continued to practice their faith devoid of opposition, and in turn their worship became devoid of meaning. The life of the church had simply become checking off boxes of Christian to-dos, participating in church activities, participating in Christian activities, having some Christian conversations, without it ever impacting the worship of their hearts and their minds. And so it had become this, this legalistic show for others. They had learned how to game the system of being a good Christian. 
Our, our world and our cultural values in 2023 echoed similar traits that show an appearance of having things put together. It's competence, it's capability, it's know-how, perhaps it's how well you can articulate yourself, it's charisma, it's, it's very outward focusing. For some of you that work, think of what your, your employers demand of you most of the time. For many of you that have been working for 10, 20, maybe 30, 40 years, how often do they need to have check-ins with you? All they say is, just have your deadlines met. I don't care how you do it. I don't care how, where you work from. Just have your deadlines met, and it's, it's done. That's all I care about. It's not about the process. I think of myself as a student where, where for so many times it wasn't about, for me, being a procrastinator, where it wasn't about learning the topic or the material, but it was just getting it done. I just needed to, to put something, some semblance of, of a well-thought-out something and, and just hit the submit button. The, the mark could be an A+, plus, but I wouldn't have learned any of the content. The compliments from our supervisors, our employers, or our teachers, they might be glowing, well done, well done. But the process was lacking. The integrity of our work suspect. Our work habits, are, which are important to our employers and, and as students, those things are important to us, but so too is the process. Our work habits, our worship of the Lord with our heart, body, soul, mind, and strength, that is as important as our finished product, being sanctified, being in eternity with God. The process matters. And we live in this time right now in 2023 where it's so easy to have an appearance of being a Christ follower. I can post something, you know, online. I could, I could type into my, I could type into Google, inspirational Christian quote. I could throw it onto something on a social media page. I could, I could sit with my Bible and a cup of coffee in front of this, this sunset. I could take a picture of it and say, God is good. And, and to anyone coming across that social media screen, man, Gabriel is the real deal. He's, he, he, he's got his spiritual life together. And this is not to chastise. It, for some of you that do this and want to encourage other people and do earnestly study and look through these, these books and share these great quotes, all power to you. But it's so easy at the same time to disguise and to feign spirituality. We can consider the, the activities, you know, we think of ourselves, well, I'm a Christian. How am I a Christian? Because of where I spend my time on on small groups, I make an, I make an evening of it. Um, on Sundays, I get up a little bit earlier. For us at Jaffrey, we get up way earlier. Um, I spend a couple hours at church. The tasks themselves can be so empty. I think about this for myself as I was preparing this, just having this word penetrate my heart. How many times where I've Okay, it's time for my devotions. I put down my phone, and I hastily read through the passage. I hastily pray my prayer, and it's time for me to get on with my day. Or I think about the times where I've sung the songs, the lyrics on the screen about surrendering my whole heart or, or Jesus being all I desire, and I've sung those songs when there's a disconnect with my heart. Or I've sat in worship where you guys are, and I've heard, the, I've heard the pastor preaching, and it's in one ear and out the other. The fallacy is that there's so much to do in our time. There's, there's so much for us to get to, that we're busy people. How many times have, has, has somebody said to you, hey, how are you doing? And you've answered, I've been busy. There's this fallacy that there's so much that we need to get to. One of the greatest idols of our age is, is the tyranny of the urgent. We have so many things that demand our attention now and require it to be done yesterday. Everything demands our attention, and there's nothing left for the most important things. 
How many times have we thought, you know what, I've just got to get to church. I've just got to get, fulfill my Christian duty, get to 1030, and then get on with the rest of my life, my responsibilities, the things that I got to do. When did our church service worship time become this thing that we need to, to clock in and clock out of? When did our worship service time become something that we need to put in our hours for so that, so that we can transactionally get paid in heaven? When did the worship of a holy, living, pure, amazing, almighty God become so transactional? Jesus is giving the church of Sardis and he's giving us this stern wake-up call. It's not about having your likeness in the pews. It's not about having just being here and maybe having some fake noise come out of you. It's about real, authentic worship. Sardis was a city that was built on top of a large cliff. It was on top of this high cliff, and it was surrounded by these huge high walls. It was seen as invincible, the city impregnable, and was set up with perfect natural defenses. This command that Jesus gives in our passage today to wake up, was a sobering reminder to the city of how their city had been defeated, how it had been sacked twice. In the first defeat, the watchmen failed to detect an enemy climber making its ways up the cliffs and then over the walls. The watchmen had fell asleep on the watch. Eventually, the city was rebuilt, and you'd think they'd be more aware of what had made them so vulnerable in the first place, more aware of their weakness. But the, the city fell in a similar way. On a second attempt, another enemy climber discovered a vulnerable spot and with a band of 15 others, climbed and opened the gates from within, allowing the enemy to pour in and defeat the city. The people of Sardis, they didn't learn from their mistakes. They didn't learn to strengthen those vulnerabilities because they had this false sense of security. Because they never learned from their mistakes, they failed to remain alert. And so this wake-up call that Jesus gives his people, while it's, it's stern, it's a grace from the Lord who is slow to anger, who is abounding in love. He doesn't want this repeat in history where this city had remained, but had failed to remain alert because, and to ward off physical danger. This church was in the same position of being negligent to their spiritual crisis. Jesus needed to wake up his church. Paul explains that God's kindness is meant to lead to our repentance. It's, it's an awakening of our need to return to him. God, who is steadfast, he displays his grace in this wake-up call. He displays his mercy. He displays his long-suffering, his patience, his kindness. God could wipe us out in an instance because of our sin. But time and time again, God gives his people fair warning. Not just warning, gives them fair warning. These calls to repentance are, are so common through our Old Testament as God sends his prophets to tell his people, repent, the day of the Lord is near. All these calls for repentance, as we see in the, in the Old Testament with the Jews and the Israelites, they fail to repent time and again. In the New Testament, the language is different. It's a call to discipleship. It's a call to take up the cross daily and follow him. It's a, call, it's a call to take your discipleship seriously. What's troubling in verse 3 is that we see 
if you will not wake up. There are some who hear the heed, who hear this warning, who hear this wake-up call, and who don't take advantage of this grace. They remain perfectly contented to sleep. I'll have more time. Just let me live like this for a little longer. It's this, just continuing to hit this snooze button, this cosmic snooze button. They refuse to wake up to this call to discipleship. And then suddenly, suddenly, Jesus describes that the judgment will come as a thief, swift and unexpected. Judgment will come like a thief, swift and unexpected. And while Jesus uses similar language to describe the day of the Lord when, when he will return and he will be king of kings and lord of lords and every knee will bow, while he uses similar language to talk about the end of days, in this case to the, book of, to the church of Sardis, he is speaking about punishment or consequences for our hypocrisy and our empty worship. The consequences of our sins don't just come at the end of days, but you see your consequence of sin, your empty worship today. And so Jesus is saying the time to change is today because God will not be mocked. The hypocrisy that we reap will be sowed. If the, if the trajectory of our lives are based on these fallacies and these compromises with the world, then when the time comes, when judgment comes, when the consequence of sin, of living in compromise comes, then we will come crashing down. The fall will be devastating. Sins that were in the dark will be brought to light. It is better to wake up now and strengthen what remains, to strengthen that faith that we have in Jesus, to rediscover him anew. It is better to strengthen what remains. Like I said at the beginning, I'm neither green thumb nor black thumb, but one thing that I am is I'm my mother's son, and so my mom is a green thumb, and she says, you know what, a lot of plants, yeah, they, they struggle, but they're not beyond the, the point of being something you can't salvage. And so my mom has revived, <laughs> I take my plants to plant care, and so my mom has revived so many of my plants, and it took a little bit, it's, it's, it's less than you think it takes. Maybe it's just correcting how much light it needs. Maybe it's how much just refreshing the soil. I don't want to embarrass myself in front of, of Tasha here, a professional farmer, so I'll keep, I'll keep it simple there. But it's not as far to revive and to strengthen what looks like it's dying. Jesus says to the church of Ephesus a few chapters ago, some of us need to rediscover our first love. That's what makes our worship so hollow and empty is because we don't remember who it is that we get to worship. Return your heart to worship. Walk according to Scripture. Wait for Him in prayer. And you will see your desires, your appetites slowly changed. Christian, the opposite of the tyranny of the urgent, of our busyness, of our I gotta get to the next thing that makes, that can uh, contribute to making our worship so empty, is that we're too fast. We just need to slow down. Engage your heart and your mind with Him. Make time for Him. Deliberately carve out time. Choose to meet with God without distraction. To make this more concrete, um, I know that Pastor Ken has been inviting us to, to bring our Bibles and, and to turn to our Bible rather than a device. There are Bibles found in our pews. You can bring one from your home. Because I, for one, know how distracting my phone is. It's a message here. It's a media app, that, media app, media app there. It's a game. Anything. Just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to follow along in the Scriptures but my phone is such a distraction. If, you're, if your phone is a distraction, then flee from temptation. Open the Word of God. 
Jesus is not playing games here when he says that you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Re-engage your mind and your heart for worship. If you come to the church and you're on your phone the whole time, scrolling through media apps, running, reading funny memes, you know, I get it, sometimes there are important things to tend to and you do need it. But if you're just coming here and, and, and the whole time you're on your phone, what difference is it with those cardboard cutout fans? What difference is it with those cardboard cutout fans? Your likeness is there, your butt might be imprinted into the seat, but you were never really here. What chance does the King of Kings and Lord of Lords have to engage your heart's worship if, if your phone, six inches from your face, has your divine attention, captivates your heart and mind? Jesus is not playing games here. And he goes on to describe how these present realities will shape their future standing. He says in verse 4, yet, if you, yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in, in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus, thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my God and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." The ones who remain faithful to the end, who have not strayed from the narrow path, they are the ones who will be found worthy. Now, there's different worthiness that we might misunderstand in our culture. You know, I, I know many of us watch tons of those Marvel movies, and, and worthy, worthiness seemed like it was this elusive thing that was only for a select few. Worthiness that Jesus is talking about here, worthiness can be understood and defined as matching up, being consistent, or being congruent. Worthiness is found where your profession of faith with your mouth matches up with the reality of the faith in your heart. Worthiness is consistency. The people that are worthy towards the end of days are those whose Faith matches their heart worship. Paul explains in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 that those who walk in a manner worthy of God are called into his kingdom and in his glory. Inversely, those who do not work in a consistent way where their faith, the faith of the, the professions of their mouth, matches with the consistency of their heart, they are not worthy. All who are worthy will be dressed in white, a color signifying purity. It was worn in festivals, celebrations, and ceremonies. And we see in chapter 7, you can, can, talk, you can look, look over there, in chapter 7, together with all the other Christians, they will be dressed in white. There are some things that Jesus in Revelation, he alone is worthy to do, to open the scrolls. But his worthiness has been given to all Christians. And, and where we think that, oh, for, for me to be a worthy Christian is elusive and it's, it's meant for those, those special people, those special people who are able to, to do special things as Christians. No, because together with the millions of Christians before us and the many after us, we will be saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. We were meant to be worthy people. We were meant to be consistent people. And as we see in chapter 3 here, in chapter 7, those who are worthy, their names will be found in the book of life. The book of life was a scroll with all the names of those who were saved and cloaked with the righteousness or the worthiness of Christ. And Jesus says in verse 5 that those who conquered will be clothed thus in white garments. I will never blot out the name of, never blot his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my God and before his angels. There is an assurance here, there is a grace here for us 
For Jesus to say that he will not blot or erase their names from the book of life, it doesn't necessitate, it doesn't require the other side to be true. It doesn't mean inversely that Jesus will take a cosmic eraser and erase names out of the book of life. Names that are written in the book of life are there forever in permanence, established before time began. What Jesus is saying here is an assurance that to all who are called, who all who call upon the name of the Lord of Jesus, all have been justified. To those who walk in his ways, the consistency part, and to those who see the fruit of the Spirit's evidence in their life, they will have full confidence that their names will be found in the book of life. God guarantees it, and God alone is the one who is sure to be able to make it pass. For some of us, this worthiness, this reorienting of ourselves, I, I don't want to come with fire and brimstone and make you doubt your salvation. For some of you, you are in Christ, but for you to realign your worthiness, it's as simple as reviving that plant that I talked about. It's just one thing or two things that you need to give up from your compromise. For the plants, it's, okay, maybe it's just repositioning it to get sunlight, refresh the soil. Maybe it's how much you're watering or overwatering it. All who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, if you have done that, if you submit your, your life to him, you are saved. If you walk in his truth of the scripture, if you try your best to follow the scriptures, if you see evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in your life, your name is inscribed in the book of life. This call to wake up that Jesus has for us is a grace to us, is a grace to us that life can be better than what it is, that there can be more joy that there can be more satisfaction in our God in heaven. To end, Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 4, I urge you to live a life worthy, consistent, matching up to the calling that you have received. Brothers and sisters in the church, let us wake up let us turn our dead, hollow, empty actions into songs of praise, into worship of our great God. Today um, is the time for our remembering of Christ in communion. For all who are in Christ, who have confessed his name, who profess him as Lord and Savior over their life, you're invited to partake in communion. If there's anyone who has not uh, received the cup and the bread, please raise your hand. The ushers at the back will, will make their way to you. Um, uh, one in the front here, uh, Ellie in the front, Sam. Anyone who has not received yet, yeah, yeah, we will wait for everyone to receive. Um, Prima's making his way. He's coming. He's coming. This cup and this bread symbolize Jesus' body broken for us and his blood shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. The worthiness that we're talking about today is not based on your striving for perfection. It is not by your works that you are saved. We are cloaked in the righteousness of Christ, but this still requires us to make every effort to live in obedience to him, out of our love for him. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread of Christ, the body of Christ together. Then after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the blood 
of my new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. All who are in Christ are freed from sin and are called to be worthy. Let us partake of the blood of Christ together. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your grace to us. We thank you that you care not just about where we end up in our destination, but how we get there along the way. You care about our process. Your heart is for us to be shaped into the person, into the image of Christ. We thank you that you invite us to wake up and God, we, we pray for, for eyes to be fixed on you and hearts and minds engaged in our worship of you, our great God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Gabe, for the message this morning.